Good morning, church family. It's good to be in worship today. The, uh, um, it's time for worship to start again. The people are gathered. The people are gathered here. The people are gathered virtually. And we're ready for God to, to speak to us and God to touch us in a special way. Those of you who are gathered in person, uh, please complete a Connect card, the blue slip that's in your bulletin, and drop it in the offering plate. That would help me out a lot. Uh, there's also, don't forget your name tags, and there are large print bulletins in back if anybody would like a large print bulletin that has the lyrics, the song lyrics and everything in it. And there are hearing aid assistance, uh, or hearing assistance devices also if anybody needs that. If you're online, welcome. Fill out a Connect card for us so that we know that you're here, or put your name in the, in the comment line so that we know that, that you're with us this morning. I'm glad that you're able to join us in this special way. Wherever you are, there are a variety of ways to participate in the offering today, and I just lift this up once in a while so that everybody remembers we have online giving, and you can do that right on the, the Facebook page where you, where you are, uh, or if you're on YouTube, you can link, go back over to the Facebook page or the church website, and of course, if you're, if you're here, you can do that on your phone or you can do that at home as well. I'm passing around a sign-up sheet. This is for liturgists and communion help during the Vesper service. Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, and the Wednesdays after that, we're going to have Vesper services like we did last year using some of the Taze music, uh, which, which many of us enjoyed a lot last year, and I hope that many of you will come and participate. I need people to read, and I need uh, people to help with communion each of those weeks. And we decided to pass it around because there are people who we don't ask to help with those things, that might be interested. We just don't think of asking you. So if that's something you think you might be interested in doing, go ahead and sign up. I've presided over 46 funerals since I came four and a half years ago. We've all been through COVID. We've felt the grief of loss of security, it seems like. That's what it feels like to me. We, felt the grief, we have felt the grief, some of us, of a loss of, of uh, hearing or eyesight or mobility. Life is filled with many, many griefs. Today, today I want us to think about the things that make us hurt inside. Think about the things that we've lost, the things that we yearn for, the people that we remember. Because today we're going to ask the question, from whom does our help come? From whom does our help come? Where can we find comfort in our loss? Let's prepare for worship as we listen to the prelude this morning.
Lazarus, though dead, was called to life by Jesus, calls to the life of righteousness. As others witnessed this miracle, they believed in Jesus. We believe in the power of Jesus to conquer our fears and doubts. Praise God who has given us Jesus. Praise God who has given us life. Amen. This is a time when we can share our joys and our concerns with one another. What, do you, what joys or concerns do you have this morning that you'd like to share? Uh, Valerie called last night and, and Mike had some sort of episode yesterday and was in the ER yesterday evening, uh, but he, they were getting ready to send him back home, so we want to lift him up in prayers and whatever is happening with, with his health. Valerie, of course, has been kind of down with her, with her hip lately, so uh, she needs prayers as well and the family of those families of those who were killed in the accident last night near Jefferson. No cancer. Salome's aunt, whom we had lifted up for cancer a couple weeks ago, that was a misdiagnosis or a miracle, depending on your perspective. And we give thanks for, uh, for the fact that that's not cancer, uh, some walking pneumonia that they can deal with. Uh, so that's a, that's a wonderful thing. Thank you for sharing that. Robin? Okay. Les, uh, my brother-in-law, Les, who uh, had the double lung transplant uh, six weeks ago or something like that, uh, is home, believe it or not. What a miracle that is. And uh, uh, just watching them go through this process has been absolutely amazing. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the whole procedure, uh, the fact they can do it is just amazing. So they are home and happy to be home, uh, glad to be able to eat their own cooking again, and they'll be making regular trips back to Iowa City for checkups. We want to remember all of those who suffer domestic violence in our, in our community uh, around, around the world. Uh, but uh, some special ones that, that Barb knows about in our community, we want to lift them up, and those who care for them, those who are looking for safe housing, those who are providing support and counseling, uh, that's an important service in our community. Okay, Les is a good, a good candidate for the radiation uh, treatment that they're, that they're looking at, a specialized thing, so uh, we're, grateful for, for the, we're grateful for the miracles of medicine, how God works through our doctors and nurses, and uh, Les will have an opportunity to do that uh, soon. It sounds like in the next couple weeks they'll have something scheduled and get him going. This would be Deb Davis's sister then, right? Okay, I knew the name was familiar. It took me a minute to, to get it put together. Uh, so Eileen Wirt's daughter had a heart, severe heart attack, right? Okay, uh, so we want to uh, lift up uh, Eileen and her daughter in prayer. Uh, Deb Davis was a member of the, of the congregation here. We buried her several years ago. Uh, that's, our, that's my connection to her. Let's see. Kathy Richardson is in, is in uh, Mayo Clinic We're doing therapy after uh, some, some surgery on her, on her neck and everything. So we're going to lift her up in prayer. And I think you've covered everyone else that was on my list. If there's nothing else, let us pray. Creator God, Lord of love, we come before you to give our thanks and praise. We believe that you care for each one of us, so we bring our gratitude and our concerns to you today. While we feel intensely our own needs, our own hurts, our own worries, we ask that you open our eyes to the needs of others for whom you would have us be your hands and your heart in this world. We pray for those among us who have broken bodies. People who are suffering from the loss of a loved one. People who struggle daily with mental illness. Children who find school to be very difficult. Neighbors who are lonely, wondering if anyone cares. Lord, lift us up when we are down. Give us strength to stand when we are weak. 
encourage us to take a step forward even on wobbly legs. Trusting in you and your power and your promise to answer our prayers. On this President's Day weekend when we as a nation honor two of our greatest presidents, we pray for wisdom for our leaders. We pray for truth-telling. We pray for moral courage. Remind us, O oh God, in a, in a spirit of, of unity in all peop- with all people around the world, that all nations are in need of your guidance. They're all, all nations are in need of people who listen to you and follow you in their daily decisions and their actions. Lord, we lift up those especially who are in Syria and Turkey. UMCOR is working there, being our hands and feet on the ground, but we pray that you will work through all of the aid workers, all of the emergency workers, all of the pastors and caregivers in that com- those communities to provide comfort to those people in that devastated part of the world. Lord, we pray for those who face unrelenting poverty, those who face injustice and a lack of hope. We pray for the day when all people shall shall stream to the Lord's house and walk in the Lord's ways, when justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, and when every man, woman, and child can sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, and no one has to be afraid. Hasten that day, O Lord. In faith, we lift up all the prayers that have been brought before you by your people today, those that are in our hearts, those who have been brought in the pastoral prayer. And we pray all of these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, now joining our voices with the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture today comes from John chapter 11. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And Mary was one of those who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after he, this he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. Those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard Jesus was coming, she went and met them, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not come to the village, but still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in her house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they, she, they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take the stone away, Martha, the sister of the dead man. And said to him, she said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So he took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so they may believe that you have sent me. When he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go.
grief. As a young widow trying to raise teenagers alone. Grief is the man so filled with shocked uncertainty and confusion that he strikes out at whoever happens to be nearby. Grief is a mother walking every day to the cemetery to stand for just a few minutes alone at her child's grave, knowing that part of her remains there in the cemetery even as she goes about the rest of her day. Grief is the silent knife-like terror and then sadness that comes a hundred times a day when you start to speak to someone who's no longer there. Grief is the emptiness that comes when you eat alone after eating with someone for many years. Grief is teaching yourself to go to bed without saying good night to someone beside you. Grief is the helpless wishing that things were different when you know that they are not and cannot be again. Grief is a whole cluster of adjustments and apprehensions and uncertainties that consume us and make it difficult for us to redirect our energies to the rest of our lives. In today's story, grief is the two sisters sending word to Jesus that their brother is ill, hoping he can prevent his death. Grief is the the dark, hopeless anger they felt when Lazarus died before Jesus arrived. Grief is Martha running down the road to meet Jesus and scold him. Now you show up after it's too late. What's wrong with you? It's all your fault. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Grief is two women hoping beyond hope that Jesus can do something, anything, to make life better even after four days. Grief is two fairly young women whose parents are likely dead and whose brother has now died, who apparently are not married, have no means of financial support, and their fear for what tomorrow might bring. Grief is, is Jesus, the resurrection and the life, the King of the universe, the Almighty God in the flesh, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who holds the keys to hell and death. Grief is that very same Jesus weeping over the death of a friend. Grief is universal. If you're a human being, you've probably experienced grief. And certainly when we start to talk about grief, we we think of death, but grief comes in other shapes and sizes as well. When I think of grief, some of the things I, I think of are my grandparents and my dad. I think, of, I think of Bill, a friend who was killed by a motorcycle when we were in college. I think of the first funeral at which I co-officiated in Armstrong, Iowa. I think of the, the first funeral I did for someone for whom I had come to care and, and how the tears just automatically started coming and how embarrassed I was, but how the family just felt like we were all in this together. I remember Christy, one of Robin's students at the Wesley Foundation. I remember the first infant and the first child that I buried. I remember every person I've buried from suicide. I remember the double funeral that I performed. And there are so many others over the years, the names start to blur together. But I've learned something, and that is everyone grieves differently. And we grieve over all kinds of losses. How about the the loss of a job or the loss of a dream? How about the loss of safety we all experienced during COVID? Or, Or how about the grief over a broken marriage that many have experienced? The grief over losing precious items in a fire. The grief that parents of children with disabilities experience every time they realize their child won't be able to do something that other children usually do. 
How about the grief of aging, losing hearing or eyesight or driver's license or mobility? Grief comes in all kinds of colors and shapes, and our response to grief is as diverse as its causes. Sometimes grief even happens before we lose something. Have you ever heard of anticipatory grief? That's when we, when we begin grieving something even before it's gone. And sometimes, sometimes we grieve so hard before something's gone that it's a relief when the person dies or when it finally happens. And then we feel guilty because we don't feel so sad. We feel relieved. Our twisting gets very, very, our thinking gets very, very twisted when we start thinking about grief. The one thing we must not do is push our grief down inside of us. In her first book, Marilyn Abraham writes, we signed up for a hike with a ranger who told us a remarkable thing. When a tree's life is threatened, stressed by the elements of fire, drought, or another calamity, it twists between, beneath its bark. Have you ever heard this? I had never heard this. It twists beneath its bark to reinforce and make itself stronger. On the surface, this new inner strength may not be visible, for the bark often continues to give a straight vertical appearance. Only when the exterior is stripped away or when the tree is felled are its inner struggles revealed. That works for trees, not for people. We cannot allow ourselves to bury our grief and become so twisted inside that we cannot go further. There's no denial of grief in the story we read from the Bible today. The 11th chapter of John faces grief head on and we see Jesus coming to comfort and be with some folks who are grieving, some very close friends. So we're going to explore that story today and we're going to see how God might speak to us in our grief. The raising of Lazarus is, is kind of the culmination of John's gospel. It's at least the culmination of the, of the miracles in John's gospel. Jesus literally walked toward death, toward Lazarus' death, and toward his own death, because this is when he starts moving toward Jerusalem. Remember, he's only two miles away now. He starts moving toward Jerusalem, where he will be convicted and killed. When Jesus arrived in Bethany, he entered a scene of people grieving and people who had experienced loss. And in those days, families hired mourners to, to wail with them. It was expected that even the poorest family would hire two mourners who would wail along with them to, to outwardly show their grief of their loss. So that's what he's hearing as he walks up to Bethany. And Martha went out to meet Jesus. She's, Mary stayed home mourning and but Martha comes to Jesus and said, Lord, if you had been here, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Mary says exactly the same thing a few verses later. We've all done that, haven't we? If you had been here, if I'd made a different decision, if they'd gone to the doctor beforehand, if, 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 if only. Sometimes that's wishful thinking. Sometimes... It's a way of asking the question, why? Why did this happen to us? Why did this happen now? Why did it happen to this person? Where are you, God? The Bible has many laments in it. A lament is a, is a cry out to God out of our grief, our sadness, our pain, our struggle. And, and it, can, it can sound like hopelessness. It can sound like, like being angry at God. And, and sometimes it is. But the Bible leaves lots of room for us to talk to God in our grief and gives us lots of ways to be able to approach God out of our hurt and even out of our anger, crying, where are you, God? It's a well-known tradition in the, in, the Jewish, um, in, the, in the biblical tradition, the Jewish lament. It's a way of approaching God with our, our grief, our bargaining, our anger, our complaint, and God's shoulders are big enough to, to take all of that. For instance, Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me? forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Or Jeremiah, why is my pain continuous, my wound incurable? 
and there are many, many more in the Bible. The Bible gives no simple answers to any of these questions, but it does give us room to lament. It's okay. Excuse me, it's okay to grieve. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to cry. It's okay. Whatever your expression of grief is, it's okay. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be depressed. It's okay to, to keep busy if that's what you have to do. It's okay to feel like you're losing your mind. You probably aren't. Those are all pretty normal responses. And the Bible gives us plenty of room to grieve in whatever way we need to. After Martha and Mary lament with Jesus, we see something remarkable in this 11th chapter of John. Jesus enters into their grief. Jesus enters into the grief of Lazarus' family. In verse 33, when Jesus sees the people weeping, he's deeply disturbed in spirit. In verse 35, Jesus wept. What we see in this story is that God is in the flesh fully present and engaged with the grief of this family, engaged with the grief of these people whom he knows and loves. N.T. Wright, Bishop Wright, puts it this way. The word through whom the world was made weeps like a baby. Isn't that cool? The word through whom the world was made weeps like a baby at the grave of his friend. Only when we stop and ponder this will we understand the full mystery of John's gospel. Only when we put away our high and dry pictures of who God is and replace them with pictures in which the word who is God can cry with the world's crying will we discover what the word God means. That phrase in there, the word who is God can cry with the world's crying. God weeps with us as Jesus wept with Mary and Martha. It captures what's, what's happening in this passage. When Jesus finds himself among people who are weeping, he weeps. When Jesus finds himself among people who are grieving, he grieves. When Jesus finds himself among people who are hurting, he hurts. When Jesus finds himself among the lost, he gives them a hand and direction and hope and love. Some have said that Jesus' tears here are not tears of grief, but they are tears of frustration that people do not understand what he's doing. I think that's reading too much into the story. Jesus is grieving. Bottom line, he had a heart of flesh, just like us. His friend died, and he was sad, and he wept. Not only for Lazarus, but for his two friends, Mary and Martha. Jesus understands our grief. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, we do, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus, I think, was, was connecting with all the griefs of his life. You don't come to become 30 years old in the first century and not experience death around you. And in fact, we don't think about it much, but have you ever thought about what happened to Joseph? He was there when Jesus was 12. He wasn't there when Jesus died because he asked John to take care of Mary. That wouldn't have been necessary if Joseph was alive. Sometime between the age of 12 and 30, Jesus' earthly father died. And I think that's that grief. We, we grieve all of our other griefs, all of our other griefs each time we grieve. Jesus understood grief from his own personal perspective. And, and he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you in John 14, 18. Matthew 5, 4, he said, Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. In verse 25 of John 11, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The critical takeaway is that Jesus' tears are tears of grief. Not tears of despair. Not tears of hopelessness. Tears of grief. And he's the one who says, there will be no more crying or mourning or pain for the old order of things will be passed away. Despite all of that, his grief 
and his loss are real, and he understands where we are. But he doesn't stop there. Third, Jesus prepares for action. John Calvin wrote, Christ does not come to the tomb as an idle spectator, but like a wrestler prepared for the contest. Jesus rolls up his sleeves and he goes to the tomb. And after, after he prays, he asks for the, for the stone to be removed, much to the protest of Martha, of course. And then with three words, with three words, he changes the world. Lazarus, come out. Remember, back in verse 4, Jesus said this illness is not, does not lead to death. That's because he knows that, that there's no power greater than his power of life. Jesus knows that raising Lazarus will clearly illustrate God's glory that day. In this story, Jesus entered in the pain of, and the anguish of Mary and Martha and stepped up to say, Lazarus, come out. And I think when he told Mary, I'm the resurrection and the life, I think he was telling Mary, Mary, come out of your grief. The cross is where Jesus entered the grief and the suffering of the world. Come out of your fear of death. He experienced the death of abandonment. Come out, for you are not alone. He saw the gaping yaw of hopelessness. Come out, for all is not lost. He experienced the prospect of letting go of everything and everyone he knew. Come out. Because I have something better for you. Whatever kind of grief you're experiencing, Jesus says, come out. Come out. Come out of your shame and grief over being fired. Come out of feeling sorry for what you will miss. Come out of the emptiness of lost dreams. Come out of the fear of the loss of safety. Come out of your grief of your loss, of your friends. Come out of your grief. Come out of your grief over your stuff. Come out, over your, come out of your grief over secrets that you can't tell. Come out of your lonely grief after a broken marriage. Notice, not get out. Come out. It's an invitation. Come on out. Jesus says, come out of your grief and your loss and your darkness. Come out of the, of the darkness into Jesus' light. Come out of your sadness into gladness. Come out of your, your grief to Jesus who suffers our pain and knows our grief. Come out. Come out. Come out to Jesus. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, come out. Come out of your sin and your guilt. Come out of your loss and your emptiness. Come out to a new life in Christ. And go into your neighborhood and share that new life with a friend. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.